Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ivor Horn. I'm going to get us started. I am the official timekeeper. That is my job. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on this last day and hanging out until the end. Um, we're going to start and we're going to talk about pulmonary disease and management and talk about asthma and tuberculosis. And our first presenter is um, going to be speaking about the effects of an M-Health intervention on asthma symptom control in inner city teens. Her name is Lola Awanyenka. Did I get that? I probably got it wrong. <laughs> University of Wisconsin, Massachusetts. Thank you. The University of Wisconsin, Massachusetts sounds like an interesting <laughs> combination. Uh, so as Dr. Horn said, my name is Lola Awayinka. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I work at the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies there, where we've done a lot of work uh, using technology to try to improve healthcare behaviors. So before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about asthma. I think everybody knows that it's kind of a disease of the lungs, but I think what a lot of people don't know is how severe the burden of asthma is, uh, particularly in Wisconsin, as Milwaukee, where we did a lot of our recruiting, has the third highest rate of asthma in the nation. So asthma affects 8% of the population and 10% of children. The rates across the board are rising, and it's an expensive disease. Uh, in 2002, we were spending $53 billion on it. In 2007, $56 billion, and that number just continues to rise. Uh, the other thing is, aside from being expensive and uncomfortable, it also results in a lot of lost productivity. So one of the other things that I think is really critical about asthma that a lot of people don't recognize is the huge health disparity that exists within asthma. So as I said, 10% of children uh, have asthma, but in African Americans that number is 16%, and this group's number is rising at a faster rate than any other. Uh, African Americans are also four and a half times more likely to be hospitalized and three and a half times more likely to spend time in the emergency department uh, than non-Hispanic whites, and so you can see that they're really uh, taking a heavy share of the burden. So it's a lot of bad news about asthma, but there's some good news about it as well. The first is that uh, with proper management and education, the symptoms of asthma and the outcomes of asthma can be controlled. Uh, attacks can be avoided with education and training. Uh, the problem is, is that more than half of children are not getting this proper education. They don't know how to respond to an attack, how to recognize the early symptoms. They don't know how to use their medications correctly. And as a result, we're seeing those hospitalizations. We're seeing those emergency department visits. Uh, the other thing is that we've found that only 30% of kids are receiving an asthma action plan. So an asthma action plan is basically a physician guided tool to tell you how to handle your asthma. So they give you a little bit of information and it spits back what specifically you should do in that situation. Uh, they found that this is significantly able to reduce the uh, an attack and reduce the symptoms of asthma, but only 30% of kids are receiving this plan. So with all of that in mind, we decided to develop MCHESS. So what MCHESS is, is it's a mobile, comprehensive health enhancement support system that provides information, support, and decision-making tools for kids suffering from asthma. So we know that education can improve their outcomes, so we decided what if we could put this education in their pocket. So the services that MCHESS has include educational information, that asthma action plan that I just mentioned. It had a social networking component mainly to keep them using it. Uh, it had a place where there was personal stories uh, and other kind of more cartoonish examples for the kids about asthma. Uh, there was some case management access where each kid uh, had access to a nurse practitioner that they could text or email directly from the phone. And it also, of course, collected a lot of surveys. So that's what our kids that were randomized to MCHESS got. We also had some controls in the study, and they basically just got the same smartphone but with a link to an asthma education site, and then, of course, our data collecting surveys. So basically how the process went is we brought the kids in at intake. We took their height and weight. We asked them a lot of questions. We had them do spirometry, which is a breathing test that tells us how their asthma is doing that day. 
And we also had them take the asthma control test. So I think a lot of you are probably familiar with that test, but for those of you that aren't, the asthma control test is a clinically validated tool that's designed to basically let, uh, let a phys physician know when a patient is in asthma trouble. So we kind of use this as our gauge to measure how well kids' asthma was doing over time. So our intervention period was 12 months. That's how long they had the phone. During that time, we, of course, collected more data uh, in terms of surveys. But what we also did is we were able to monitor everything that they were doing with this phone. So we could see what we call their use data, which is what pages they're viewing, how long they're spending on them, how many days they're logging into the system, all of that type of stuff, just because it's really important when you're doing a mobile intervention study to be able to know whether your outcomes or lack of outcomes outcomes are what, because of whether or not they're using the system. So at exit, we met up with them again, got some more information, and then t turned off the service to their phone and then followed them for an additional 12 months after that. So uh, one thing that I want to mention is that the, par the target population we wanted were inner city teens uh, that were struggling with asthma. So what we did is for our recruitment, we went through um, managed care organizations. And so we only enrolled kids who were on Medicaid that were 12 to 18 years old and had a current diagnosis of asthma. So in the end, we had 218 participants that were randomized. Uh, we put 131 on our chest arm and 87 on our control arm. And here are our first results. So the first results that I want to talk about are the results of that, what I called use data. Were they actually using our system? So the graph on the left in green is showing the number of days uh, each user was using chess. So you'll find that the median here was 184 of the 365 days that they had the system. The next is the total pages viewed in chess. And you can see here that the spread is, is interesting. Um, for the most part, they were consuming just a ton of pages. It was more than we had ever seen in any of our other studies before. Uh, we'll talk about what those pages were in a minute, but the median pages viewed during their time on chess uh, was around 5,600. So how does that compare to other mobile interventions? So what you'll see here, the blue line is the time at which the app was either downloaded, if it was a free mobile health, line, or mobile health app, or the time that we gave them the phone. So the green line is your standard mobile health app that most of us might have on our cell phones. Uh, what you find is that by the time one month hits, no one's really using it anymore. With our MCHES app, by the six-month mark, we still had 73% of the kids still using regularly. And by the 12-month mark, over half of them were still using. So it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting that we were able to get them to continue logging in for so long. So what exactly were they doing? This is really the big question, and I think uh, where a lot more of our future work is going to be. So what you'll see here is a list of some of the services that we had on chess. Uh, the three that were the most popular were the My Team, the My Messages, and of course, My Surveys. Uh, what's interesting about this is that the My Team and the My Messages are kind of the social networking pieces. The My Team was basically like a Facebook for asthma, and my messages was where they could send messages privately to one another. Uh, in terms of the educational stuff, uh, the asthma action plan, medication management, all those other cool tools we put in there, those all fit into that tiny little green slice we call other. <laughs> so. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to show you is our survey completion rates. Uh, thanks to the monetary reward, we were able to get them completing surveys about as long as they were still using the system. Uh, the red line on top is our MCHES application survey completion rate. The blue line is the control. You can see that they're fairly similar. Uh, so though we did have some loss of participants, um, it was pretty comparable for both groups. So the interesting results, what happened to that asthma control test score? So like I said, this is the clinically validated tool that's telling me whether their symptoms are out of control or not. So the red line, again, is our MCHES group, and you'll see that there's a modest increase there. You're also going to notice that our blue control line sees a similar modest increase. The only thing that's different is kind of how they got there. So both groups ended up having right around a two-point improvement on the 25-point scale. 
Uh, but what we found is that the MCHES group got there a lot more quickly and the control group just sort of caught up over time. Uh, the next results here, these are a little bit uh, trickier to interpret if you're not familiar with the asthma control test, so I'll walk you through these. So what you're going to see on the left is a graph labeled respondents with scores of 19 or less. So why 19? Well, 19 is the clinically validated cut point for when you cross from controlled to uncontrolled. So if you have a score of 19 or less, you're considered uncontrolled and you should be brought in for further management. If you're above 19, they'll usually leave you alone. So what we found is from baseline, we were able to reduce the percentage of our respondents that had a score of 19 or less. The one on the right is showing who has a score of 25. So 25 is the highest possible score that they can get. And here again, you'll see that both groups had some improvement, but there was a greater improvement uh, in the MCHES group. So to recap what we've learned so far. First, our system was used, though not as intended. Uh, we knew that education was not going to be their primary driver, but we really thought that they would use it a little bit more. Uh, second, we've got that modest increase for the asthma, in the asthma control test for our control and our MCHES group. Uh, third, both had fewer uncontrolled participants and more with a perfect score. And some data that I didn't have time to show you because my green light's going to turn colors soon uh, was that our younger participants and those that had more severe asthma seem to have better outcomes. Uh, the other reason that we're not showing this data is this study is, is, has first been completed. We just finished our 12-month follow-up, and so we're still doing a lot of digging into the data. So this is pretty preliminary at this point. So what is this telling us? Uh, the biggest thing for us was that when we were tracking it over time and seeing how much they were logging in, we really thought, oh my god, their asthma control test is going to be amazing, like they're learning everything. Uh, but despite that, the improvement was pretty modest. And the other thing is that our control group eventually had the same improvement as MCHES. Uh, we do have some evidence that some groups may benefit more than others, so when you put all these things together, what exactly can we take from this? So what am I really telling you right now? And I'm not sure yet. That's the answer. <laughs> but a couple things that we're thinking might be going on and that we want to explore a little further are first is that maybe it's those people that are actually using those education tools that are spiking that early improvement that we see in the MCHES group. Uh, we know that our education content stayed static over time, so it's totally possible that that content was consumed when they first got their phones, they looked through it, they read everything that they thought they needed to learn, and then from there they just didn't really use that part anymore and went back to Facebooking or whatever kids do. Um, so that's the first thing that we think, and we're going to have to go a little bit further into that use data to determine whether that's actually what's happening. Second, we think that it's possible that some groups might benefit more than others, and they might also be responsible for that spike. So like I said, we want to dig a little bit deeper into these age result or this age effect that we think we're seeing, as well as this pulmonary function effect that might be there. Uh, and finally, we think that it's possible that just the survey prompts that were given to both the control uh, groups and the MCHES groups might be what's causing that spike in the control. And my light's gone red, so if you have questions about that, we'll talk about them. <laughs> so uh, the biggest thing is I do want to still have time to thank everybody that helped with this project, and at this time I can take some questions. any um, text message reminders to use the program, like on a weekly basis or monthly basis? We did not. So all of the use that was sustained over time was pretty self-driven. Okay. Um, what are your next steps or plans? Um, I, I see there's some spirometers you can connect and maybe if they saw. Sure. So I'll go back to my future direction slide that you didn't get to see. Uh, so with this study, we, our center works on a lot of different chronic diseases. We are not asthma specialists, 
I am and a few of the other people on staff have a background in it. Um, but right now we don't have any plans to continue this study. A big part of this, and some of you that have heard us speak on chess have probably heard about this before, is that this study actually ended up being ended abruptly. So we did not reach the number of participants we intended because one of the biggest issues that we had was that the kids were not using the phones the way we intended and not in that, oh, I'm a parent and you're not doing what I want way, in a I'm going to meet some people on the internet and run away from my house way. And so after a few uh, incidents such as that, we decided IR, our IRB was going to let us continue, but we felt that in good conscience that we couldn't continue to enroll in this study. So at this time, we've kind of just taken the data that we had. The kids that were on study, we allowed them to continue, uh, but we don't really have plans to go further. So the spirometry information is there is what was collected at intake and exit. So we do want to go ahead and that's one of the things that we do is want to do is see if the exit lung function was affected by MCHES use, but we're not going to go back and, and start this study again. That actually was leads into my question, which sure. was how did you moderate the, the Facebook, the My Team section, and then it sounds like there were some unfortunate incidents. Did that occur during the MCHES or was that just using the phone? So <laughs> It was an interesting study. We learned a lot about teenagers. Um, in terms of our moderation internally, you know, the Facebook type site that we had set up on there was really closely monitored, monitored but in terms of what they were doing on the rest of the internet, that was more, you know, the parents had to do a consent form that addressed the fact that they could choose what type of security settings they wanted us to put on the phone and so if they allowed their kids to go completely on the internet like we did definitely get a lot of phones back with a lot of internet porn and things like that so do you think and you said you're not going to do this study again but just kind of in general do you think that there might have been or there could be opportunities to have some of the the messaging in that social media part of the site, so maybe to have someone, you said you were monitoring it, could it be that some of that messaging about the asthma could be through like a, a profile or maybe like a, a control like, you know, kid that's similar to that to help sure. approach cheese? And, to use and so one of the, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to go into the features, is one of the things is there were two kind of avatars that lived in chess and they gave messages about asthma control and things like that. Uh, the biggest thing that we were honestly monitoring is for some reason kids really there's a lot of pictures of like genitals and just really inappropriate things and that's honestly the thing that we spent the most time monitoring is, you know, we ended up making it where all photos had to be approved before posted and, and things so that we could try to get ahead of it instead of taking things down that were inappropriate. Yeah, it was an adventure. <laughs> I'm going to cut it off Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Our next, Ooh. Our next presenter is um, Dr. Richard Garfin. He's going to talk about high tuberculosis treatment adherence obtained using mobile phone for video direct observed therapy results of a binational pilot study. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, let's see. So we, um, in San Diego, we live at the border uh, between right on the border with Mexico and uh, the US has a problem with TB but Mexico has a bigger problem with TB so in the border region we actually have a concentration of of this problem and so it's an it's an uh, it was a ripe area for doing this kind of research so to give you a little bit of background about tuberculosis it's an airborne infectious disease that um, affects a third of the, of the world's population. And you can see it's concentrated in areas like Asia and Africa, uh, but we have quite a bit of it in, in the Americas as well. It's the uh, second leading cause of death among infectious diseases worldwide. And it there's 11 million current TB cases worldwide um, with almost 9 million new cases every year. Is this advancing by itself? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so I have to talk faster. Um, and it leads to over a million deaths each year. So it's a, it's a major public health problem, and we're hoping that we can help to solve some of that with mobile health. 
Um, the good thing is, is that TB can be cured with six months of antibiotics, um, but adherence is critical in order to um, make sure that we do get cure. Um, contributors to poor adherence include long treatment regimens. Like I said, it takes six months to treat in, in a garden variety case. It could take up to two years in drug resistant cases. The medication frequently has side effects. It's um, um, toxic to the liver, and so you have to monitor liver enzymes. And it can be un contraindicated with other medications. And during the time that you're on treatment, you can't drink any alcohol, which makes some people not want to take it. Um, but poor adherence is, uh, is a big problem, which can lead to drug resistance. And in fact, more and more cases of TB now have multi-drug or extensively drug-resistant um, strains of the bacteria which don't respond to our antibiotics anymore. Um, and when you do have drug-resistant TB, it, it requires that we use second-line drugs, which are much more toxic and less effective than the primary drugs. They dramatically increase the time of treatment and the cost of treatment, and the transmission and these drug resistant strains can be transmitted so that somebody who acquires them now can't use the first line drugs. They have to go immediately to the second line drugs. So how do we prevent this from happening? Well, because this is such a public health issue, it's not only a problem for the, the people who have the disease, but also for the community who could be um, acquiring their disease. Um, health departments advocate something called directly observed therapy, which is where a health worker it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor. It could be a, um, somebody from a health department or even a, a, a peer can watch the patient take their pills every single day. And <clears throat> in developed countries like the U.S., we actually send people from our health departments to the patient's home every single day to watch them take their pills. In developing areas where they have fewer resources, the patients are required to come to the clinics to receive their, their pills every day. But we're talking about six months of somebody visiting you every single day to watch you take your pill. Um, the reason that we do this, though, is because it improves adherence. It reduces the risk of acquired drug resistance. Um, and it also allows for intermittent dosing. If you actually know that people are taking their pills as scheduled, you can actually have them taking them every other day or three times a week as opposed to every single day. Um, and so it can reduce the number of total doses that people need. And it's been shown to save millions of lives. And so the World Health Organization and the CDC recommend this. But there's problems with DOT, and the barriers are that it costs a lot of money, requires a lot of manpower, transportation is always an issue. It's impractical in rural settings where it takes a long time to get there. It requires coordination between the patient and the provider. Both people have to be at the same place at the same time, which means it's limited in when you can do it. It restricts patients' mobility. They can't travel because they have to be where their providers are. And there's concerns about privacy and stigma. You know, if the health department's showing up at your house every day, your neighbors start to wonder why this, you know, why you have this visitor every day. Um, and, and patients, frankly, feel patronized. So we said, well, can we do this remotely? Can we do this in a way that's more cost effective? And we've actually had, you know, the the technology for quite some time. So we said, look, can we do this, though, with mobile phones? And so we got a grant from the NIH to try this out. Um, so what we did was we developed a mobile phone application, which I'll show you in a, in a moment, um, to, to deliver DOT remotely via mobile phones. And we um, designed a little study to evaluate it. So the evaluation was intended to assess the feasibility, acceptability, and potential efficacy of a video dot for monitoring TB treatment. And we conducted a single arm trial where all the patients got the video dot. And, these, um, and our intervention was informed through focus groups with patients, providers, and health officials. And we conducted the study in San Diego and in Tijuana, so we had the ability to sort of see how it worked in both a resource poor and resource rich area. So the design of the study was we recruited um, uncomplicated cases of active TB 18 years or older we obtained written informed consent from all the participants. The, par the patients were trained by their TB caseworker, not by our staff, to actually use the phone and deliver the DOT because we wanted that to see how the health department could actually implement it. We included a brief pre and post um, assessment questionnaire to see how people liked it. And we monitored the patients on video DOT uh, until they completed treatment, so however long that took. And patients got $25 for each of the questionnaires, but they didn't receive any incentives for actually sending videos. So this is what the um, intervention looks like. The patients were given a phone, and we, we gave them the phones, and it's a smartphone that has a back-facing camera and a little kickstand so they can set it up 
I don't have a pointer, but that lower left-hand corner there. Um, we asked the patients to have all their medications in front of them and their water, and they set up their camera and they start the, uh, start the recording on the camera, and they can actually see themselves. And they hold up each pill and they say what they're going to take, and they drink their water, and when they're all finished, they press a button, and um, the video automatically encrypts and gets sent to a server, a, a HIPAA-compliant secure server where the videos are stored. And then uh, the DOT worker who's there in the middle can log into a, a secure website and pull up the video, watch the video, and then just check off, did the patient take their medication today? So basically the same process that they would do in the patient's home, but this way they're doing it remotely. And if you can start the video for me, please, if you look in that right-hand side, this is an actual patient um, who's taking his medication. Good morning. Participant ID 858-752-7382. I'm at home this morning. I'll be taking uh, two recapin, 600 milligrams. So you can actually see the pills quite clearly on the video. 1,750 milligrams of pyrazinamide, three and a half pills. And notice how many pills he's taking. This is another reason why people don't like to be on medication. I have 1,400 milligrams of ethambutol, three and a half pills. Sending my next video tomorrow. So that's it. It takes about a minute, you know, and the video is sent over to us automatically. The DOT worker can have a caseload of 30 or 40 patients and go through them in, in an hour and be done. Um, the nice thing is that the videos also are stored on the phone until the phone can actually send them. So if the patient's out of cell phone range, um, the video sits on their phone until they get back into cell phone range and then they're uploaded. And we've had patients who've been traveling and they'll have three or four videos sitting there and when they get home, the video gets sent and the DOT worker can see them. So you have no loss of, of, of the recordings. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, and in order to teach the patients how to use the video, we created this brochure which actually has pictures and um, instructions to explain the process to them in case they need re you know, a refresher. And then we also provided uh, local phone numbers for emergency contacts and things like that in case they had any problems. So what did we find? Um, we enrolled in our pilot 43 patients in San Diego and nine patients in Tijuana, and this is all through the local TB control programs. Um, there were actually six patients in San Diego who were binational. They're patients who spend a lot of time in Tijuana as well, and these patients would not be eligible for DOT in San Diego because they're, they're not around to be, to be observed. So this was actually a, a benefit for our health department. And this just shows that we had a fairly um, uh, broad range of patients in terms of demographics. And I just want, also wanted to point out, we had two patients that were, one was 84, one was 86 years old. So we, we actually could see if this technology could be adapted by our older patients. Um, we did have seven patients overall that switched back to the standard in-person DOT. Um, three of them were patients that we actually found out later had um, extra pulmonary or uh, multidrug resistant TB and they were, were not supposed to be on this anyway. And here's the good news. What we found was um, over 90% of all the videos that we expected to receive, we actually did. So these are monitored doses. So um, this is actually better than the health department's record of in-person because more often they have a problem getting to the patient's home than we actually had getting videos from our patients. Um, it would it only took a couple of days. This is the number of days that we had to provide training to the patients before they were able to do it on their own. Um, when we asked the patients, how often did you have problems recording a video, the majority said never or rarely. And then when we asked them if you had to redo your, your treatment, would you use video dot versus in-person dot, and the majority said we would prefer to use video dot. And when we asked if they'd recommend video dot to their other people who had TB, every one of them said yes. So we felt like the patients liked it. So in summary, the feedback from the patients, providers, and our health officials was mostly positive. The patients reported that they appreciated the mobility that the video dot allowed them, the convenience of being able to take medications on their own schedule. They didn't have to wait for a DOT worker to show up at their home. 
were positive. But we did have one patient who actually wanted to go back to the standard in-person DOT. And it turns out this was a woman who had three little kids at home. And she said her life was so hectic, she didn't have the ability to sort of plan out when she was going to do her video. She just liked somebody knocking on her door and saying, hey, take your pills today. So that was the one, one person that actually wanted to go back to a standard DOT. Um, the provider said it was great because it provided high adherence and patient satisfaction. Um, there were significant savings in terms of staff time and transportation. There was some problem with some of the videos um, not uploading when they expected, but we've learned that if they just wait a day, the videos show up, and, and they actually were happy with that. And we had about 13% of the patients that this didn't quite work for. But overall, we found <clears throat> that the video dot was feasible, acceptable to most patients and providers, and it worked in both countries. Um, that was just a binational example. So the next steps of our video DOT are that we're updating the video recorder application. We tried it on one Android-based phone. We want to make sure it'll work on multiple phones, maybe eventually iPhones. Um, we're also going to be updating our client management system. This is the screen that the DOT worker sees so that it um, has more flexibility. They could record more information. Um, also, we can um, enroll more uh, programs. So we tried this in two programs. We want to make sure that we can expand this out to thousands of programs, potentially. Um, we also are going to virtualize this so that it will run in the cloud. So again, it makes it more uh, easily expandable to other health departments, and not just in the U.S., but internationally. And we want to evaluate the system with more complicated patients, patients that might be taking split doses throughout the day or um, on different types of schedules. And I, I want to um, say that we received a grant from the Verizon Foundation to take the technology that we developed in this pilot and do the, um, do the expansion, do the, up, the upgrading that I just mentioned that we're going to do. And that we're, our next step is to um, test out that the new technology in San Diego and in San Francisco uh, later on this year to show that this technology works. Once we're at that point, then we can start to uh, invite other health departments to take advantage of this technology. And with that, I'd just like to thank my partners at UCSD, um, the California Institute of uh, Telemedicine and, and in, um, Information Technology, uh, the two health departments in San Diego and in Tijuana, and, um, and my co-investigators. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, I think this is great. Um, have you considered using it, um, you know, in clinical trials, a major problem is adherence and compliance with medications. So have you thought about piloting this in maybe a clinical trial to increase adherence or compliance? Uh, if you know of a clinical trial that would like to use it, we're more than happy to talk to them. I think that, thank you for bringing that up though. We're, we started with TB because adherence is so important and we already know that health departments are investing a lot of money in doing it. So we looked at this as a way to save costs. But I think other applications, other diseases, say HIV, it's important to have high adherence. Clinical trials where adherence are important, um, that it's a, it's a good application there as well, and we'd love to see it used that way. Thank you. Thank you. This is great work. And I actually turned around and saw Kevin Patrick in the back, who I've known <laughs> for many years. My question is, what was the educational level of the participants? And also, since everybody talks clearly in dollars and cents, and you say this was done to cost um, do you have cost savings? Do you actually have um, a, a graph that shows the difference in the cost of doing it this way versus the people knocking on the door? We don't have that graph, that graph yet. We're working okay. on doing the data collection for the cost comparison. Um, I can tell you that in a pilot study where they used a landline-based phone um, prior to this, um, with nine in nine months with 33 patients where the health department was able to do this by um, kind of like a Skype version. They saved um, over $25,000 in travel for 33 patients in nine months, plus almost a half of an FTE of an employee um, in that period of time that they didn't have to go out and do this. We think this is going to save even more money because we um, are giving patients more flexibility. So uh, we don't have that data yet, but we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to show that. Those of us who really want to save the prevention fund, I think these dollars need to be in graphs and made available to advocates like us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, we have our next presenter who's going to talk about text TB. 
um, Sarah Irabaran. Irabaran. Yes. Um, from University of Utah. Well, that was actually fantastic having someone kind of preface uh, what I will go into as well. And thank you for coming. A lot of times when people hear the word TB, they run the other direction. Um, next to screen. Okay. So I just wanted to mention this was funded by an NIH grant uh, as well as Sigma Theta Tau International. I just wanted to comment. I was connected in Argentina because I was a Fogarty International Clinical Research Scholar there for a year, and I maintained contact with the regional TB director in order to establish this study. So that's how I got to Argentina. So I won't even touch on this because he basically said all of it already. The one thing I will comment uh, in addition is that TB is one of the three leading causes of death for women aged 15 to 44. And unfortunately, like many other infectious diseases, uh, it's concentrated, the, the heaviest burden is felt in uh, developing countries. So what's the problem in Argentina? Well, like was mentioned, the World Health Organization recommends that at minimum 85% of treatment is completed successfully in order to control TB within a population. And unfortunately in Argentina, the treatment success rate has been from 46 to 48% in sputum smear positive cases. That is active contagious TB cases. So less than 50% are treated successfully. And you can see that in the bar graph there, and that's been for even over the last 10 years. I think the max was 66% treatment completion. So our study was to assess feasibility, acceptance, and initial efficacy of a text messaging-based uh, intervention in order to promote adherence, provide support uh, in settings where self-administration is standard. So unlike the U.S., uh, dots is not always provided. And actually, I didn't show the stats, but in Argentina, less than half of TB cases receive direct observation. So just a little more specifically, uh, feasibility, we wanted to look at how many patients could participate, how many had cell phones, and what type of cell phones they were, uh, what technical issues we would run across, and the perceptions of both staff and patients, um, how to optimize by their recommendations, as well as what types of messages were, you, were sent and received by participants. In the initial efficacy, we wanted to compare the two groups by uh, self-reported adherence rates, as well as speed and smear or culture conversion. This was a randomized controlled pilot study using MISC methods, and I didn't realize until I came here that pilot study was actually a, kind of a bad word. <laughs> But anyway, that's, that's what we did. Uh, it took place in, in outpatient clinics within a reference hospital, a TB or a pulmonary reference hospital in Argentina. And this was, um, as in many large hospitals, uh, this was not unlike uh, others where, where direct observation was not offered. We started data collection last November. We're still actually collecting the, the remaining um, results of, of treatment completion. The intervention took place for the first two months, which is considered the uh, intensive treatment phase. And we also used semi-structured interviews. And then for those who couldn't come in, we sent the structured questions via text message. Eligibility criteria were that they were 18 or older, uh, newly diagnosed, had opted to continue the treatment within this setting and were not di uh, identified as having drug resistance and that they had access to a cell phone. In order to compare the two groups, we did ask that, control, that the control group uh, filled in a medication calendar and the intervention group received the text messaging based intervention uh, and I wanted to mention that we used Frontline SMS, which is an open source platform to manage the text messages. So just in brief, again, uh, in general, it is uh, self-administration. Patients receive a month's supply of medication, and uh, the follow-up is, is per provider. In this setting, there was um, from 10 to 15 different providers, uh, and they weren't notified that the patients were receiving this intervention. So the intervention itself was uh, established in collaboration with the TB specialized team in Argentina. 
it ended up having the four components of uh, asking the patients to text in after they had completed their, uh, after they had taken their medication. Um, they received reminders if they did not or asked how they were. And they had the option to ask questions. And also received twice a week educational messages that were based on the information, motivation, and behavior skill theory. These are just some examples um, that are translated back to English. TV is not contagious by shaking hands, sharing glasses, or plates. It is contagious by coughing or spitting. Remember, TV can be cured. And those are just some other examples. So looking at feasibility results, of the 102 patients that were newly diagnosed within our recruitment period, we were able to recruit 37. I wanted to highlight that of those who could have been recruited, only three did not have cell phones. Three indicated that they did not know how to text message. And uh, a large majority were, or a, a, the large portion were under 18, um, so could not be enrolled. In regards to demographics, there was no difference between the two groups uh, on any of these variables. I wanted to highlight again, uh, like the prior study, there was an age range of 18 to 77, so seemed feasible within uh, uh, an older population. Um, and here I also wanted to highlight that on average, patients were coming from an hour, on average an hour away and up to two hours away in order to, to come to this, uh, these outpatient clinics. In regards to mobile phone access, uh, over a quarter, or about a quarter, had shared phones. Uh, nearly, or only 30% had phones that had internet access. So most of them were just basic phones. And 60% received uh, or had payment plans of pay as you go. So when they had money, they would add on credits. What was interesting, or I guess I shouldn't say interesting, unfortunately, um, nearly 60% indicated that they were not adequately informed about TB. And this is when they were, they had already gone through, been diagnosed, seen their provider, they were being sent home with a month's supply of medication. We got them at that point, what do you know about TB? And these are some of their comments. Zero, nothing, little to nothing. That it was contagious, contagious by cough or bacteria long but curable, so there were some positive things. One indicated that the doctor said, take this and nothing more. Um, one indicated, I got it because I was drinking cold drinks, Coca-Cola, and I got it because I ate out of the garbage when I was little. So it seems like education would be uh, helpful within this population. Some of the other, other technical issues that we came across was that Unfortunately, at the beginning, the modem was capturing some of the data, and so it wasn't transferring into frontline SMS. So some was missed. Patients were indicating that they were sending them. We didn't always receive them. Uh, other limiting fe features of frontline SMS was that you have to individually upload one message at a time, and there's actually a limit of 100. So when you start adding up patients um, and you're sending them multiple messages, uh, we had reached that limit and, and had to figure out what the problem was that we couldn't uh, add any more. There was a timestamp of two hours different, and we did have some auto confirmation errors because of keywords that were selected. Uh, another problem was that there was varied coverage of those uh, who participated in the interviews. About 60% indicated that they did have some technical problems. Messages were received at 10 o'clock at night, or they would be returned saying that they weren't sent. Um, and here are just some, some texts that we received that said, sorry, I didn't notify, my cell phone fell, but I fixed it. Don't worry, I took my meds. Um, yes, I am continuing to take my medication. I didn't respond because my phone got wet and I had to put a chip in another phone. Uh, another issue that was often said, if I don't send messages, means that I've ran out of credit and I was out of town without reception. A few other feasibility issues were that uh, security of the computer was a limiting factor for the nurses to be able to actually conduct the intervention. We had to have a, a, a backup plan there. 
Um, we did have challenges with trying to track patients who are not notifying. And just as a, a look at the cost, um, in Argentina it's free to receive messages, but it cost to send them. And it was for about 10, 10 cents to 23 cents, which I thought was actually quite expensive. But that price does vary and it's very hard to calculate because, for example, a, uh, the phone service would send a text indicating that today if you put 40 pesos, you get three times as many credits. So that price may actually be quite a bit less. On average, staff indicated that it took 15 minutes to an hour to respond and uh, go through the messages. In regards to acceptance, overall, uh, staff were very accepting. They indicated that the intervention could not be too automated. It couldn't simply be sending reminders or just information. It had to have interactivity. Um, they identified that a dedicated staff member had to run the intervention. Some of the comments from patients were that they felt cared for even though it was just text, that they had a friend when all others wanted nothing to do with them, that they felt responsible uh, for their treatment by texting in, and almost all indicated highly recommended for others. Uh, I will skip through some of this because I am running out of time, but a lot of, since I'm a nurse, I do enjoy what patients have to say. <laughs> Um, I, I'll just read, I guess, one. Uh, I don't forget to take my meds. This is due to you guys. So some of the suggestions on how to optimize by the patients were that they wanted to continue the full course of the treatment, uh, provide more information, provide messages from other patients, text in possibly less often, um, offer in-person consultations when they came in to get their meds, and have the option to send messages by computer. So looking at the type of messages that were sent and received, uh, over 1,000 received and 1,300 were sent. On average, there was three questions per patient, but that ranged from zero to nine. Uh, reported side effects were on average two, but ranged up to 11. And what was interesting is that patients at the end of the intervention period were, were informed that they no longer needed to text in, but that the staff was available. And on average, they continued to text in for eight more days, and that ranged from you know, zero to 53. So some people really wanted to continue to maintain, maintain contact. Looking quickly at initial efficacy, uh, of those in the control group, only 53% did return the calendars. But of, of those, they indicated that they did have 100% uh, treatment adherence. In the intervention group, 77% of the time, they um, texted in, but like I said, there were some issues, so that's kind of tough to give a concrete. Uh, there was up to 100% notification in, in many cases. But what I found interesting that of those that texted in, 83% texted in without the reminder. Um, unfortunately, looking at the most objective outcome, in Argentina, we're finding that not many are given or offered uh, a follow-up test. So over half of the patients did not have sputum smear or culture follow-ups in order to compare that. But like I said, we'll follow these patients and at least look at treatment completion. Other unexpected issues actually ran out of TB medications nationwide uh, within the National TB program. There was many internet outages and electrical outages. And in conclusion, um, again, there were many feasibility issues, but it seemed like a contextually appropriate intervention within this setting. And clearly at this time, smartphone interventions uh, would not be applicable yet, but I think that could be in the near future. And we didn't have funds to provide phones. Um, but patients that Shared phones did have the lowest rates of notification. Overall, it was well accepted. Um, and one of the secondary outcome is that uh, calendar notification really didn't seem to be an effective strategy to monitor for adherence. So future direction. Ideally, we would have to have a contract with a phone company in order to make it free to text in, have some kind of, these are just some thoughts that we came up with in order to try to scale up. 
um, have an adjunct program to send the educational messages more easily, and there would really need to be a strengthening of how to uh, trace patients and bring them back to treatment. So I'll just end with a few more patient quotes. Uh, often one does not become aware of a disease until they suffer from it. Then one sees and notes the ignorance that we have regarding it and the degree of discrimination that exists. This was a text from a patient. Thank you. I think we're going to move on to our next presentation, and then if we have some time, then we'll do questions um, at the end. Um, next, we have uh, Barbara Masoudi. Did I get that right? Masoudi. Masoudi? I'm butchering names today. Um, t speaking about Breathe, Breathe Easy, a smartphone app to manage asthma in underserved populations. So we're back to asthma. Okay. This, this is my thing for changing. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, please excuse me if my voice is not so good today. I'm going to try to try to get through the presentation clearly. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a project that we did along with the Virginia Commonwealth University, so I'd like to acknowledge my co-author there. So this is part of Project Health Design, a uh, program sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation where um, <clears throat> we were looking at developing and testing innovations in personal health record applications. We were part of five teams that worked together on Project Health Design Round 2, um, which is part of the Pioneer Portfolio at RWJ, which um, seeks to support really innovative projects that really lead to breakthroughs and change sort of the nature of health and healthcare for Americans. Um, I will kind of skip the background on asthma since we had that already, but I will say that mental health comorbidities, depression and anxiety are associated with more severe asthma and they do uh, occur in a higher percentage in an asthma affected population than the general population. And together, both of these conditions have multiplicative effects on the quality of life. Um, so what we did was uh, we wanted to look at a six month evaluation period of uh, a mobile phone based tool for patients with asthma and a dashboard for the clinicians uh, treating them to look at the utility and usability of these tools, changes to communication behaviors, quality of care, including whether patients were satisfied with their care, their adherence to therapy, environmental controls and avoidance measures they could take, take place. Um, in, in their lives, and then symptoms and observations of daily living, which is a term that Project Health Design uses to talk about things that happen to patients in between office visits or clinical encounters that are really important in terms of managing or affecting the disease conditions they have. So we took patients at two VCU primary care clinics, about 30 people all together, who uh, were diagnosed with moderate or severe asthma. Um, and the overwhelming majority were female, African-American um, adults with uh, overall low household uh, annual incomes of ten dollars to $15,000 a year. So this is a very low resource population. Um, they had high school or less education. Um, and when we did our initial focus groups, we pulled patients out who also had mental health symptoms, but we found that those were overwhelming sort of their management of the asthma and discussion of the asthma. So we needed to then go back and um, just take asthma patients and not pull patients who specifically had mental health um, illnesses because we did not think that was going to um, work out well for the six-month trial. Um, and then they entered their information on their phones at their uh, choice of time each day. And then we enrolled the clinicians, so physician and nurse teams who treated those patients, and those were 20 clinicians altogether. They practiced in these clinics. There were 13 family physicians, seven nurses. Uh, and the nurses use kind of a disease management protocol to uh, assess the dashboard and then make escalations based on their clinic procedures to the physicians when it was necessary. And they were each paid $500 per practice for each patient for the six month worth of the study. This is what the phone looked like. We used the uh, Samsung Captivate um, Android phone. And we, as I said, we developed the dashboard and made it accessible through a link in the EMR program. 
Um, this is what the phone app looks like. Um, you can enter your daily data, enter um, rescue medication use, enter your peak flow. We gave the patients all peak flow meters and asked them to do that once a day. And then, of course, the phone would also save unsent data and send it when they were in a, an area with signal. And then patients could review their own dashboard data through their phone as well. Um, so a couple of the, the questions you can see here, what symptoms did you have today? Um, all of the questions like symptoms, triggers, and things like that that I'll show you in a second were based on the NHLBI guidelines for the management of asthma. Um, and then we also looked at things like mood and anxiety. We collected the actual peak flow numbers as well. This is kind of what the dashboard looked like. Um, the desired states were like green stars. This is fake data. I'll show you some. I think I have some patient data coming up. Let me see. Um, and then um, we recorded the peak flows in the green, yellow, and red zones based on the patient's personal best. Um, so this was able to give the clinicians a quick view across the last few weeks or month and see how the patient was doing and what the trends were. They could also check off which um, variables they wanted to view in the dashboard. So if they wanted to compare two things together, they could customize their view by checking those boxes off. So these are the observations of daily living we collected. Um, a lot of them were around medication use. Of course, there's two kinds of medication broadly for treating asthma, the, the controller medication that you should take on a daily basis to prevent symptoms, and rescue medications that you take when you have symptoms in order to control those symptoms in more of a, an immediate way. Um, we asked them the reasons for not taking those, because sometimes patients don't take medications. We wanted to know what the reason was, um, as well as the reason for the use of the rescue medication. Um, and then any triggers they encountered, the symptoms they had, what their activity level was, what they um, did in terms of activity and the duration, any limitations they experienced due to their asthma. Um, we also had an accelerometer app in the phone, but it turned out it was a big battery drain, so no one actually used that. Um, and then we had mental health status with those emoticons that you saw on the previous page. And then, um, believe it or not, a lot of these, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but some of these patients still smoke. So we collected information on what they were smoking and how much, um, as well as difficulties with sleep, which can sometimes be present in patients with moderate to severe asthma due to symptoms. Um, so our evaluation methods, we also did a mixed method study, both qualitative and quantitative. We did usability testing of the application on the phone and the website. And then we did some um, pre and post intervention tools, basically surveys, um, focus groups with patients and clinicians because we took a user-centered design approach for the uh, development of the phone app and the dashboard. And so we needed to meet with them in advance of even designing or developing anything to get what their preferences were, their needs, their wants related to these technologies. And then we did pre and post um, actual screens for depression and anxiety. So I'm going to talk about the focus group results um, right now. <clears throat> We're still also in the process of analyzing the ODL data because there's so much of it. Um, and, and we did not have a focus group, I'm sorry, we did not have a control group in this study um, due to the expense of providing the phones for all the patients. We were not able, given our budget, to provide phones for the six months for 30 controls as well. So we, we did this kind of as a preliminary study. Um, the patients said that they found the phones were really easy to use. Um, the only technical glitch we found with the phones was that the data, turning the data off was very close to the power button on this phone, and the most common problem patients experienced was that they turned the data off and couldn't understand why it wasn't being sent in. Um, <clears throat> so that was something that we ended up having to respond to a lot of phone calls and text messages about. Um, but once that was cleared up and they learned about this sort of, sort of unique feature of this phone, um, they were able to get past that. Um, some of the patients had never, the vast majority had never used smartphones before, so we needed to talk to them about like what, what swiping meant um, and how the phone actually worked. They were used to kind of like the flip phones. Um, they, they also enjoyed collecting and viewing their observations of daily living. They felt that it helped them really understand their triggers and what kind of control they had over their asthma much better. Um, 
I will also say that, um, you know, when, when I described this study to some of my colleagues, they all said, are you kidding? Why are you going to do a study in a population that has 10 to 15,000 um, household income? Those $450 phones are going to be gone in, like, no time. <laughs> We, we had a couple phones uh, that were stolen. One was recovered. Um, but we just, we accounted for that. And I would say that there were no more phone losses than in any other study that you might do where you give people phones. Um, the patients actually really appreciated the fact that we were doing something for them. And um, they were super in terms of their um, communication with us and letting us know when they were not going to be able to send their data in. Um, for instance, one, one lady had a, um, a planned cesarean and texted us and said, I'm going to be out for three days because I'm having my baby. <laughs> um, so, you know, they were, they were the best patient population I've ever worked with, actually. Um, so they were fabulous. So now I have a good response for all the naysayers. <laughs> um, the clinicians thought the tool was not overwhelming to use. They were really afraid of that because they said, you know, we have such little time um, in these clinical encounters that we just can't do something that's going to throw us off or give us, um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff to look at. They thought the dashboard was pretty straightforward and they could view it in about um, 30 seconds and see what was going on with the patient. They felt it provided clinically useful information, um, including highlighting patient education opportunities, um, which I'll talk about, uh, better medication management, and then also some diagnoses were changed based on the use of this tool. Um, in terms of patient education, some of the patients were found to be taking the medications in reverse. So they were taking rescue medications every day, but taking controller medications when they had symptoms, which would really have no effect on their asthma. Um, so when that was discovered, the nurses quickly called the patients and um, let them know about how they should be taking their medication. Um, as well, some patients were um, unsure about how to avoid asthma triggers. Um, one person actually had such bad mold in her house that um, our physician on the study was able to contact the health department and get a letter sent to the landlord that the mold situation needed to be addressed because it was causing health issues. Um, that was pretty exciting. And then three out of our 30 patients were actually found to have COPD and not just asthma. Um, and so they were sent for referrals um, to specialists, and of course they got additional medications that are specific for COPD and not just asthma. Um, as well, we had uh, patients who were discovered to have very severe allergies, and they were, um, you know, then also referred to allergies for allergists for testing. So here's an example of one patient who improved after their controller medication was started without an office visit. So you can see the peak flows don't look good um, initially, and then the medication begins. And um, the use of the rescue medication comes down, as well as the peak flows significantly improve over time. Um, this, this patient did really well, and this was a non-smoker without any other significant health issues. This patient was one of the folks who had a different diagnosis, which was suspected. It turned out it was COPD. This was a person in their early 50s who had some comorbid disease in terms of hypertension, diabetes, I'm sorry, depression, chronic pain, and lupus. Um, so this person, and, and, and you can't see it here because the referral occurred pretty late, but they ended up improving after they received the appropriate medication for COPD. So in conclusion, I'll just say that um, the preliminary results from our focus group data show that they were both got value, the clinicians and the patients, from using the tool, and that it created a good awareness among the patients of their specific behaviors and the symptoms that they were having and how they could improve those. Um, the clinicians felt like they were getting information about what occurred between office visits that they might not otherwise see, or maybe if they didn't have an office visit scheduled, even hear about in any kind of a timely way where they could help the patient um, make some kind of impact. So we feel that these tools have the potential for improving management of asthma in a population that has very little resources. Um, and we did find that it requires a new reimbursement method if clinicians were to try to sustain this kind of review of patient records long term um, because they said that they would need to be um, reimbursed for an e-visit in order to continue to review the dashboard and then contact the patients when they saw issues. 
Um, I'd like to acknowledge the um, National uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National Program Office at the University of Wisconsin, uh, my colleagues at RTI, and our, our co-researchers um, at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay, thank you. I just want to make one comment. Um, I thank you for these wonderful presentations. I thought they were all excellent and gave us a lot of insight. I think thinking about the two asthma um, studies on the book and one of the and and looking at the TB studies, the asthma studies in particular were in the context one sort of through a pair, but the other through a clinical context. And I think perhaps looking at the differences that we saw in the outcomes for one that had to be stopped and another that really showed some effects. Yes, there's an age difference, but also there was the cl trusted clinician provider, and it was an adjunct to clinical care, which I thought was kind of interesting. And we probably have, we probably have time. We're, we're over, but you have a few minutes, so if there are questions, um, please feel free. And I think we might have for one or two questions. I think just maybe piggybacking a little bit on what you say, I think sometimes with coming from kind of the public health research aspect mm -hmm. and then translating it and scaling it up, um, there is that we find, I think, within public health that the success is usually because there is that human interaction, that human component. So, I mean, maybe just to the panel in general, like future directions, where do you think, how can we keep that, that human component that seems to make these intervention so successful, and how then do you translate that into scale with using the technology? Is that, is that possible? And does it still reduce costs, I guess? I can speak a little bit to that, but not in the context of asthma. So the human interaction is something that at our center we really have realized the importance of. And so one of the things that we're doing now in our future studies is they tend to have kind of a, a moderator, like our asthma study you did, but that moderator is a little bit more involved. So we have one that's on increasing physical activity in cancer survivors, for example. And in that study, they have access to a real person who's the online train, personal trainer and nutritional educator. And that person is always sending them messages, like seeing how they're doing and things like that, and kind of keeping tabs on them um, in that context. And that's really, we found been the key in people to use a lot of our applications. Hi, my name is Raul Abdullah. I'm a resident physician at Mayo Clinic. I'm actually going into pulmonary critical care. And I actually have a question for Barbara from RTI. Um, those patients who were found to have triggers, um, were some of the triggers smoking, and were you guys able to kind of provide feedback? I know there was some behavioral modification uh, to the patients regarding the smoking as a trigger, and also the smoking as uh, possibly leading uh, to COPD in those asthma patients. Um, yeah, so um, in the NHLBI guidelines, one of the triggers is secondhand smoke. Of course, firsthand smoke is a big trigger, too. Um, and uh, the patients who were smoking were received counseling to stop smoking. Um, what we, and I just didn't have time to talk about it today, but we also had a supplemental text messaging that were encouraged um, patients to send their data in, reminded them if they didn't send it in. Um, it also included, um, you know, patient-specific and context-specific messages. So if they were smokers and they didn't opt out of receiving not, uh, smoking cessation messaging, they received that. They also received messaging around um, increasing physical activity on when air pollution alerts were occurring that they should be exercising indoors. Um, and, uh, and then they, get, they received resources, you know, just pointing to sort of like website resources like the American Lung Association and, and other places that had information, background information on asthma. Um, so uh, some of the patients actually did not have clinical encounters at all during the six months. So they may have only received the um, text messaging encouragement and, and um, we provided them with the, um, I think the quit line um, as a resource for them to stop if they wanted to stop smoking. We have not finished looking at all of the data yet, but anecdotally we did hear from the clinicians that a few of the patients stopped smoking during the six months. So. Thank you.